You're listening to Innovative Minds with Melanie Francis, where we talk to some of the top thought leaders, business leaders, and marketers around the globe. Tune in every Thursday and spark your mind. And now, let's get into it. Welcome back to Innovative Minds. I have with me today Anil Menkani. Did I pronounce that right, Anil? Awesome. Well, you got it right for the first time. Okay, awesome. So Anil been awarded by LinkedIn as one of the top 10 LinkedIn Modern Sales awardees. And I'm really keen to find out what that means and what it means to be Asia's top LinkedIn Modern Sales awardee. So we'll be getting into that. He is a B2B expert. He is just as obsessed with LinkedIn as much as I am. And I'm really excited to have him on because I love having guests like Anil come on and just share their knowledge on LinkedIn. And your specialization, Anil, is on LinkedIn sales. So that's going to be super, super cool. So my first question when I, you know, was thinking about how I'm going to introduce you, I got really curious about your award. And even from the first time we spoke, you know, I was like, how do you get this, everyone's like, you know, I'm an authority, I've got this award and I've got that. So I'm always curious because the only time I see awards come up in my email that I always like, you know, get really excited to click and then it's like, you know, got to pay for it. That's, oh, yes. <laughs> and they're like, you know, trying to get me that way. So, so how does it work in LinkedIn actually, you know, giving you this award? And is it from LinkedIn themselves? First of all, very warm welcome to all of the guys out there. Uh, thanks, Mel, for having me on this show. I was really excited with your brand name, which we'll talk a little later, which is RUB2B. But yes, going back to your question about this award, first of all, this is not an award which I've really bought. It's actually come from LinkedIn. And you can see that award behind there, uh, which is in that blue color thing. So this is an award actually given by LinkedIn way back in 2019. So LinkedIn has been giving a lot of awards and have been actually celebrating a lot of content curators, a lot of marketing guys. But this was the first time in their history across the globe. That's where they came out with a LinkedIn sales award. And this was not just a sales award. It was something which was a modern sales award. Now, I'm sure the audience would be a little curious to know what is this modern sales and what were the criteria for that? So, yes. As we say the word modern sales, the first thing which comes to our mind is digital, is online, is social selling. So that was exactly what LinkedIn wanted to kind of celebrate salespeople who are LinkedIn savvy, who are really up there on their game of online engagement. The next big, uh, I would say the criteria for them was because sales guys are not sales guys if they don't have customers. You agree with this, Mel? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, so this was very clearly the second criteria where they really wanted to see how these sales guys are doing the customer relationships or engagement. So which means and the medium for them was to go and check the recommendations of each of the sales guys who have been nominated. So of course, not everybody was nominated because there were millions of salespeople across APAC, which they were searching the top 10 modern sales awardee. So they actually went and did a lot of nomination. And one of the criteria was How good are the recommendations on your LinkedIn profile and not from your peers, not from your friends, but that's from your customers. Okay, got it. And that's how the sales guys are known for. So did you, so did someone have to, sorry, I have to interrupt because I'm curious to know, did they actually, someone have to nominate you for LinkedIn to know that you even exist, right? There's some form out there that you have to fill out and someone has to recommend you, right? Oh, yes. That was a pre-criteria before that. If you want to be nominated as a salesperson, you need to fill up a form. You need to, of course, give a little brief. And then that's not the game it is. You need to go and announce on the LinkedIn with a post and tell all your people, all your community and all your network to like and engage on the post. So that's an indirect meter of checking how are you loved by your peers, your friends, your colleagues and your customers. And once you had a larger engagement, that's where you become nominated. And then all those other criteria, which I was talking about, comes into play. Okay, cool. Okay, so when do they announce these awards and when's the time to fill in these forms? Like how can we know that this is coming up? 
Oh, I've been asked this question many times by people, especially because of being in sales and my sales fraternity has been asking that. So as I mentioned to you, this was the first time they came up across the globe and they did it for India, they did it for APAC and they did it for US and uh, Europe too. But of late, they've not come up with anything right now. They keep coming out this with for content curators and marketers, as I mentioned, but for sales, this has not been repeated as yet. Okay. Probably they still want to see the success and probably do it. Yeah. So once it comes out, I'll be the first one to know about it. This time, you never know, I might be the mentor or the coach or the judge for that. But yeah, I will probably, I will definitely share this across my network. Okay, awesome. So they haven't really done it of recent that we can all get on no. and fill in. Okay, cool. Last was 2019, which I know of. Okay, okay, cool. So I guess, Anil, the thing that when I think about sales and you say, you know, LinkedIn modern sales as well and social selling, when I think of sales, immediately what comes to my mind, this word sales, it comes to my mind outbound, okay, and and wrong or rightly and you can correct me, but that's what I think is that your expertise lies in outbound yes. and so is that correct in terms of that you support outbound, you think it should be part of the content marketing and outbound should be a part of that strategy, not just inbound, put out content and comes in. Yes, I agree to this 100% Mel. And if I have to just kind of put this in a nice sentence where I always believe that social selling, which you're talking about LinkedIn, so social selling and LinkedIn actually go hand in hand. Just like uh, I would say like an analogy for a peanut butter and a jelly mm -hmm. or probably you take a Super Bowl and Tom Brady who's been like there as an equal for seven big victories. So it's all about creating that outbound magic with your three C's, which I call it, of which the first is the content, which you rightly mentioned. If you're not out there, you're not creating or curating content, then you cannot be out there. So that's the first C according to me. The second is how are you building this or creating this magic with your community? which we call it as network. So today you have your network, you have your followers which are there. So how are you creating this community and giving them the right value? That's the second C which I talk about. And the third C which I always talk about is the commitment of time, which means the dedication. Today, you being a yourself, being very active on LinkedIn. So it's not easy to go out and post content or post uh, stories or post videos and audios. It's very important to be very committed. And that's what I believe in. So if you do this three C's, which I talked about the content, the community and the commitment, then the outbound reach by default becomes easy for every salesperson. Got it. Got it. Tell me from the start then, if outbound's the thing, how do you curate the list who you're going to outbound to? What are the little secrets? Do you believe that the list should be curated from a different place outside of Sales Navigator? Or do you think Sales Navigator's got enough data? Or it depends. I'd love to know that from the start. So when you start to curate a first audience. So what I do normally, I just give you a, a real life story. This was about 2018 when I entered APAC, which is in Singapore. I moved from India after my 22 years of career. I decided to move outside my base location, which was India and start managing APAC. When I moved to Singapore and it was for a series A funded company, which was into the marketing automation. And before that, I was leading a team of 120 people in India, which as a CRO, chief revenue officer. And when this founder gave me this challenge or as an opportunity saying that, Anil, this is something which I really want you to grow the business for us in the Southeast Asia slash APAC. Would you be excited enough to do? Of course, I said, it's a, something very interesting. And the second thing which he mentioned to me, Anil, I agree you'd find it exciting, but let me give you a little more thing. You'll have to work from the trenches because you're the only salesperson mm -hmm. will be going and starting. So it means employee number one in the APAC region. That's where I told him. Hey mate, don't worry about this because that's something which is my strength. And today everybody as individuals should know what is their strengths. So I've always scaled organization. And when I went to APAC and just to answer what you asked right now, I only had two uh, weapons as sales guys or arms and ammunition what we call in sales. The first one was LinkedIn and the second one was Tech in Asia. So Tech in Asia is a leading publication digital house, which really curates content and gives a lot of business houses what is happening out there in the industry. So from Tech in Asia, I used to actually go and find out which are the businesses getting funded, which is Series A, Series B, Series C and Series D. And based on that intel, I used to actually go on LinkedIn and actually find out who are the right people and at various levels, which is L1, L2 and L3 and find out about them and then actually do the business and find out who's the, in the information which is there about 
who is getting the funding who are the right people who is the c level guy who is the growth head who is at the l2 which is the person so this was my way of going and approaching using the outbound reach okay and, i have yeah. to ask you stop you there how many is possible then in a day with all that research you're doing because you're not just like curating a list on sales navigator you're going and sitting there and researching who got funded who's the right person to outreach to you're saying you're customizing this whole process where right. there is you know so in realistically then say you're doing this how many would you expect from your sales guy if you hired one tomorrow to outreach to on that level See, very honestly, Mel. Over the years, I've become a little more wise and smarter. And because since I also run an ad tech, which is Salt and Pepper, which is between a similar industry, I've learned the nuances of LinkedIn algorithms. Okay, so I know for a fact that outbound reaches cannot happen beyond fifty per week, which is about two hundred per month. But if I go back, and if I have to kind of look at which are the, what my sales team will actually go out and reach people. i would say see this is basically a funnel we all know the sales funnel so there is the top of the funnel the mid of the funnel and the bottom of the funnel the top of the funnel is basically a tab which is a target addressable market and that can be anything mm-hmm. so you should keep filling in as much as you can the healthier the ta- the top of the funnel it becomes easier for you to have this mid and the bottom of the funnel and we all know the conversions are not that easy assuming let's for example or hypothetical sake we have 100 in the top of the funnel we know for a fact when you do this outbound reach it could be through linkedin through so sales navigator or could be through your other cold calling generation mechanism what will actually convert will be actually about 20 people who will show an engagement to you who will reach out to you i'm saying it's one fifth the conversion from that 20 actually which will finally get into that relationship getting into understanding of your product i would say about five to six of them and eventually that will probably some of them will close so we all know that funnel becomes much more steeper as you go down so higher the top of the funnel then it's a call which you take as a sales person how much do you want to do an outbound reach for example as i said the algorithm says you can reach out people about 50 a week which you can do so i think and that's good enough for a sales guy in a week to kind of outreach to 50 people at a go so linkedin stops you at 100 they say max but some people get stopped at even 10 depending on That's where their profile lies agreed, so agreed. um like i know my sales guy um that is doing it just got banned within you know he was doing like seven a day and he's like how the hell are you doing 100 but i've been so active on my profile for so That's long that i'm not you know i'm not picked up so you've got to really warm up your account and that's a exactly. really big tip that you know you can start with like doing outreach of two or three a week and then we'll like then warm up to like seven and then warm up to more each week on which otherwise he's been banned four times in him oh god i think i saw that post <laughs> it was really it was a really very nice funny post which i saw that yeah. but you're right it depends on how warm your linkedin profile is based on that linkedin of course allows you how much can you do an outreach got For it some it could be seven i agree <laughs> so so you saying that you used external data then you hone in on the linkedin sales navigator to then identify who is who in the zoo now tell me about the messaging and do you customize your message how much customization do you do on that actual outreach to oh, try and get a response that's my favorite question mm-hmm. <laughs> of being an avid linkedin guy so i call this a rule of 3 which means before you go all out and reach somebody for a business which is could be a prospect or your existing customer you need to follow this rule of 3 which i've curated it the first one is the personal request the invitation what you were talking about right now so when i'm actually going out suppose if we, you and me are not connected mel i have a choice to go and just say press the button called connect and that's where boom the message mm-hmm. goes to you anil wants to connect you but you being an active linkedin person there will be thousands of people who will be trying to reach you out every day mel mm-hmm. and now if i have to ask you a question reverse how many would you accept in a day assuming if you get 1000 invites every day and which are all generally saying hey uh, mel anil wants to connect with you or if there is a request coming from anil saying that hey mel it was nice being on your show and i've been reading a lot of content about you are you b2b seems to be very exciting sharing an invite for us to kind of stay networked in this digital world so if that's a personalized request coming to you from anil and there's something else coming from shawn is a standard random saying that shawn wants to connect with you mel which would you accept yeah obviously the more 
customized one, the more custom it is. But I also judge people if I'm going to connect with them based on their brand and their personal right. profile. So when I go look at them and they look like they've got really great, you know, content and featured articles, I don't care if they wrote me a personal note because then I all of a sudden have this different value set in my mind. Even with me, like if I was to share with you, I've done personal connections and I've done with nothing. And the connection rate for me was almost equal, even though I didn't personalize it. And I think that's because of the brand of when they go visit and look at the profile, they can understand the authenticity. So maybe, you know, if you built brand more and they go, wow, that person's really cool. They've got X followers. There's more or less, but usually salespeople don't have that brand to carry that connect. Actually, it's like the freedom to not actually have to explain it yourself as to why you're connecting because you've got a brand that carries for you. So you, now you get to do sales faster. Agreed. In fact, you got me to a point which I missed out and what I call that as something called a hygiene check. Now, before even I get into the rule two and three, so you touched upon a very important point because I call this as a hygiene check, which means if I have to optimize my LinkedIn profile to begin with, because I just can't be out there without a profile picture, without a great headline and without a decent cover image. The cover image is the free LinkedIn property which they're giving you right away. Tomorrow, you never know, LinkedIn will start charging a premium even for that. So that's why I go all out and tell people, guys, use that. You got a fantastic rectangular banner available at your discretion today to go and use that to your fullest. You could be working with a company, you could be doing your own personal branding, you could be a thought leader. Put those thoughts there, put one more image out there and make that maximum use of it. So these are the basic hygiene things for anybody. I would not say only for salespeople because unless as you write, suppose if Mel sends me a connection request, even with a personalized thing, the first thing as a human behavior would be to go and understand or find out more as a curious mind to see who Mel is. And that's where if I don't see any background, I don't see any profile picture of yours, or I just see a headline called uh, founder of uh, b 2 b I would say, okay, I don't, I don't know, it's a spam or is it a really a genuine person sitting behind? Mm. And that's one of the reasons when even for posting, when I tell people, I say, you have to use your own personal pictures. I've seen you doing that mm. very actively. Mm. Use your videos because people have to resonate with you. Today, the world is about edge to edge. It's human to human connection. Exactly. It's not about Anil Meghani working with an ex-company, talking to somebody who's a customer. It's about the people who come first as a personal brand and then the company comes behind. So I think you're right and you hit the nail where you need to do this personal hygiene checks, which are very important. The second thing which I also mentioned on this is just don't go all out and just connect with people. So Mm -hmm. like we were talking about this, you have to first engage with them. You have to show that. I put this as an analogy of uh, marrying someone. So today, for example, you are on a Tinder or on a Bumble or it could be any other website which you have access to. You will not just go all out and say, hey, guys, let's have a date. First, of course, you will do what you will do. You'll see the profile picture. You'll see how they are. What are their hobbies? So that's the secondary data, which I call about. And you go and look at that. The next thing which you will think, okay, I think the wavelength matches. That's where you start doing little conversations. Those are the short conversations which you'll do with the person. And you'll find whether is that really still matching. Once you think that, you will take that online meeting to an offline meeting. And that not will be a nice candlelight dinner. It will be first a coffee conversation. Mm. That's where you again explore more, understand each other more. And that coffee will probably change to a candlelight dinner. And of course, then it follows. And this is exactly the same way, which we all need to understand that even though if you're on a professional medium, you need to follow all these methods and processes because it's something, something similar where you need to engage with their post. You need to understand who they are, understand what are they doing in the organization. And then, of course, send out a personalized invite request. What I want to know is then, what's your viewpoint on the automated outbound strategies? Like say that you've done manual and you've figured out what's landing now and you're resonating with, okay, that you've got some real similarities. So if you like kind of did the same message that's landing for the same people, you know, and or do you think that every time you reach out, like with the connection, it has to be like, hey, I saw this and go look at their content and make it really unique? Or do you think that once you've kind of got, sometimes you're just like kind of like, okay, this is a very similar to this last person I connected with. What's your view on that, that, you know, you should automate your sales process to an extent and have templates and so forth so that it's not completely, yeah. 
Yeah, that brings me to one tip of sales navigator, which I can give the audiences out there. So today you are right. You can't keep replicating this process manually again and again. And mm. that's where you got some fantastic tools like Sales Navigator. Mm. So what you need to do is basically Sales Navigator allows you to save lead search. So today, if I'm searching, I need this certain demographic. I need this certain person in that geo. Mm. I need that at that level could be C or L1 or L2 levels. Or I need in that certain function, which could be marketing or sales or business DevOps. Once I made those searches and I've searched people, Okay, I've done those understanding and built my audiences. Then you could use a feature of LinkedIn Sales Navigator called Team, which is called Lookalike, mm. which is the lead recommendations. Once I know Mel is that kind of a personality, which or that person which I need to go and connect, then I will make use of the Sales Navigator, which is called Lead Recommendations. And then exactly LinkedIn Sales Navigator will throw me all the same people who are of the similar like. It's like a lookalike thing mm. which is in Facebook. Use that as your advantage, and then can send that automated message to that specific function because then you're not going completely personalized but at least you're going personalized based on the bucket or based on the same filter which you have done for yourself and i think that really still works on the automated side but you still cannot go all out and just do a random thing where you don't even have your name hey uh, i'm from xyz and i have this product and do you want to sell no no no, no 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 i don't think that obviously works but whether you've got like Hey, I see we're both in the X same space. Um, That's right. And you're doing, you know, maybe you put a keyword into Sales Navigator that That's, gets you into like right. deep tech or something. That's very niche. If you're connecting at the same message, only because like it's a very similar person. So you're not going to really naturally say that much different to this, to that person. Yes. So sometimes what happens is you spend all that time trying to connect and customize and and obviously, it depends on the person. If you're going to sit there yes. and go, I really want to customize this because I want the accept. But what's disappointing is you're like sitting there customizing and they might not even get on LinkedIn and check ever. Like they might not True. even be that active, whatever. It's like time management's really hard as a salesperson. You know, you're running <laughs> around and you're like, how do I divest my time? I am with you on this 100% and that's why I gave this tip of Sales Navigator. But again, since we both come from the B2B background and we both understand the space and the domain very, very well, I would still recommend all the B2B sales guys because today, as I said, on the funnel side with a B2B, if it's a B2C, I can understand because your audiences will be large, your time would be huge and it will be difficult to manage that on the manual side. But if it's a B2B, I would still say that effort of personalizing and customizing really works because we know that today and I've been in B2B for the last 24 plus years of my sales career that how many connections would I have? And as I said, 50 in a week yeah. is the max. I'm saying you could always do that. You mm-hmm. could always do that because what happens, there's always a chance and I know for a fact from 50, 30 would not actually look at my personalized customization. They would probably look at my profile and may accept. But there could be a great chance that the other 20 or the last 15 would actually look at their personalization and they will be seriously impressed so that your conversation number two and your conversation number three will really work much more faster for you. Got so it. it's worth an effort to do that, at least in the B2B space. B2C, I would still give it for the automation. Got it. Tell me then as a salesperson, you've gone and put out the connection. Where do you go record this information? Do you bother to record until they accept? So... Again, a sales navigator tip, guys, uh, people who are using sales navigator, unless if you're not using, of course, make a nice worksheet for yourself. And there are a lot of free tools, software available, which can work like a pseudo CRM of a sales force. And you can probably connect as an integrator to the uh, sales navigator and use those things. But as a sales navigator gives you a really good tip, which is syncing sales navigator with your CRM, which is typically a sales force. They have all these connectors, which are already there. What happens in that, and it could be any CRM at the mm-hmm. back end which you're using, it could be Zoho also, mm-hmm. or it could be Asana, or it could be anything else. Just that sales guys is not burdened of doing that extra or a double work. Because whatever you're doing as an activity on Sales Navigator, and if your Sales Navigator is integrated with your CRM, then what happens default, whatever you save searches will go get embedded into your CRM. Right. And that makes your life much more easier. Right. And that becomes easier. Plus, at the same time, once that CRM populates that data, Assuming, for example, Anil was working with a company called Insider. Anil has moved from Insider to a company, for example, a Blue Shift mm. or to Salt and Pepper. That immediate change, the CRM will throw up using Sales Navigator. And that's where I say, tell sales guys, create opportunities. You will see all this phenomena happening on social media like LinkedIn. Mm. You'll see job changes. You'll see role changes. 
you will see funding happening you will see new office changing you will see new leadership hires why don't we take advantages of all this phenomena which is happening take that use a personal and say hey mel congratulations for your recent funding for iub2b you guys are on the right track mm. and wishing you all the best and all the success onwards and upwards or oh, hey mel i just saw a change of role from your company x to y i'm sure this company will help you to grow much more faster wishing you all the best for your new success got it so got it take this opportunities so you know like all the stuff that sales navigator once you upgrade gives you because once you've got your target audience saved it starts giving you all this activity are you saying those activities can then go into your hubspot crm and yes. you can start seeing that activity come up in your hubspot yes you can you can see that cool plus also it gives you one more advantage is that uh, today for example if you are a large organization mm-hmm. uh, and you got a lot of people in the company assuming you are about 600 plus 500 plus people organization mm-hmm. and of which mostly everybody has a sales navigator at least i would say 50% of the employees so today there's a, again a sales navigator has a tool called team link filter mm-hmm. team link filter which helps you and if the moment you say tick so today if i want to connect to mel and mm-hmm. mel is not my first connection but that team link filter will immediately tell me there is a guy called sean in my team who is already connected to mel or there's somebody else mark who's already connected to mel so then i have this opportunity of pinging uh, mel mark or sean and tell him hey guy i think you know mel already which i can see on my sales navigator can you help me to get connected to mel because she is a very important prospect for us as organization Got so it. i think there are some great tools which are available at sales navigator which you can utilize well wow. so it tells you who your mutual connections are you're saying so that you can then pitch it that you know we've got x already connected and i'd Shared, like to connect that's right shared connections that's what they call it. got it so do you continue to create tasks and my question still remains okay you've gone and integrated hubspot with linkedin and or salesforce with linkedin got it but yeah. if someone didn't accept my connection and they were on my sales navigator audience is your recommendation to go offline and try like email outreach or or is that something you just go you know what it's just not the right time and place like how quickly do you kind of move on no so we are a sales guys <laughs> we don't we don't leave right? right and that's what we are known for so even on linkedin i always say you should attempt at least three times okay and first attempt of course and that's one of the reasons i say you should do this engagement even before you send out a linkedin invite to mel mm-hmm. i will go through mel's content which he has posted very recently i will say like and again LinkedIn gives you a lot of emojis or reactions. It's not just like it gives you heart, it gives you support, it gives you funny as an icon. Use different because like is used standard by everyone. So mm-hmm. if you have to create your place or you want to differentiate yourself with other sales people out there, try being little different. Mm-hmm. And you have to take that effort because like is very easy. While on the go, I can just do like, 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 and I can do hundreds. But if I have to use other emojis or other reactions, which is your heart or support or something else. or informative i need to actually switch and then probably go and like that so there's an effort but it's really worth the effort so that's what i'm saying you need to engage with the prospects post even before you connect assuming even if you have connected even after that you can do that start engaging with the person okay if you have sent a linkedin invite to him and assuming he's not accepting the invite as your question says go and still go and engage with his post write comments on his post hey this is a great thing i think we are in the same wavelength why don't we connect sometime over a coffee and discuss about this and don't talk about that you have sent a linkedin connection which again becomes salesy hmm. but take the conversation to a different level and if it's on a public thing which is on his comment where a lot of people are watching and he's accountable to respond to some of his comments and when he sees this fantastic comment hey why don't we catch over coffee he would say certainly for sure on that probably can say also in the parallel i'm sending your linkedin invite to you got quickly it quickly go withdraw that invite and send a new one because that's fresh in his mind but and that's what you could linkedin do. said when you withdraw the invite now they don't let you connect now for another 2 3 weeks it's a new thing no no it's only for few minutes i would say and let to not more than 60 seconds i would not i actually it's about 3 uh, to 4 minutes but okay. beyond that after that you can collect images i've done this myself okay, and cool. i keep doing this on a constant basis okay cool yeah because i thought that it 
gave no. me a message and I was like, what the hell? Like I accidentally sent an invite without yes. a personalized note. You know how that can happen mm-hmm. on the phone? And I, I do this. <laughs> and then I was like, oh my God, I need to withdraw that. Like that's not, this is a really important connect for me. And Trust me, now, now you're reminding me, I've done in a few seconds also, Mel. I forget about three minutes. I'm thinking I've done in 60 seconds when I've gone and quickly withdrawn because accidentally I sent a request, but you did exactly yeah. on the mobile. And then I quickly withdraw. And then I send a person and I've done in 60 less oh, than 60 Oh, great. Seconds. I don't know why LinkedIn was giving me that message and I was like freaking out oh, going, okay. why is it giving no. me this thing? Now I can't connect with this person. So I just left it. So let's not give, let's not give this idea also to LinkedIn. Shh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know why it came up to me because I definitely was like, oh my God. So I see you're like really personalized. How do you systemize and make sure that when that person responds, you sometimes get overwhelmed by the inbox fatigue can kick in and, you know, I know LinkedIn's introduced this cool thing with the filter now where you can actually read unread messages, which was before that wasn't even possible. But sometimes, you know, you're on a desktop and you're on there and it's opened and, you know, things can just get lost in your inbox. And like what processes do you put in to make sure that you respond to everyone, that you don't miss an opportunity and have really great, clean, disciplined sales processes? Because that's where I feel like a lot of people go wrong. Like, you know, they don't have good sales discipline. So, yeah, you're right. Most of the sales guys miss out on the follow-up because in the excitement of going and building the network and building the time for them, they will just go and send invites and could be personalized or non-personalized. But after that, then they forget. So you need to properly build up a process where after, so I have, I also maintain my Excel sheets apart from my CRM where I say, okay, invite sent. And these are checkboxes, which I do. Tuck, 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 it comes automatically after the invite send as i said the rule of two or three which i was talking about the second thing which i do is i send them a thank you for connecting me now again i just don't send that message i don't know if many people know linkedin allows you to send a subject in the messages yeah. now that's a that's not a that's not a straight way of sending a message subject in linkedin messages what you need to do when you're sending out a message instead of typing hey mel just say Thank you for connecting and just press enter, enter twice. So which means your first line and when anybody is looking at the desktop, as you mentioned, on the left hand side, because there's so many messages which are there mm. from your various connection. The first line comes as a subject headline and mm. you could try this out. It really works. It, so that's what I'm saying. It's a roundabout way. So, but as sales guys, we all known as hackers of managing things. So yeah. it does not give you a proper subject, but what you should say, hey Mel, uh, thanks for connecting. Mel, comma Mel, and just put enter, enter, put some spaces and then say, hey Mel, start your normal subject. Thank you for so much connecting. I think we are in the same domain. It's really great to kind of know you more better and other blah, 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 blah. But that the first line on the left hand side will show you as a subject line. I Mm. wish we had an online thing. I would have able to show you more that, but that's a trick or a hack, which I use it. So, So, because as you said, you get numerous messages. If I'm seeing a lot of messages, if I see the subject line, I will find it really interesting. And again, your subject line has to be really curious enough for them to go and open and click that link. Got it. How do you, do you put everything, like do you task stuff to yourself in your CRM? Like once someone becomes a connection, do you task that I'm going to follow this yes. person up every, you know, in two weeks or, you know, if they didn't respond, like how do you make sure that you remember, like you didn't hear back from them, they connected with you. How do you task all the time? So. Yeah. So what happens again, a sales navigator comes into play here where any post from my connections will show me up in my sales navigator saying that Mel posted about this something. Okay. Or Mel did some changes like this. Okay. Or Mel changed the job, which we were talking about that or changed the role or got a recent funding as a company, are you going to be? So once I get those Intel, okay. Plus I also put a task for myself saying that, as I said, I, after this first, which was the personalized invite, second is thank you. And the third is about asking for a offline conversation. I would definitely want to take the online to an offline because I think the best what you can do is when you meet face to face. How long to wait for that offline date? Like how long? Is that always your third message or? So ideally it's a third message if you ask me, Mel. But now again, it depends and there's no rule for it. Mm -hmm. Assuming you are very proactive in the first message of thank you. When I send you an invite, which is a personalized invite, you come back with a larger paragraph saying, hey, Anil, I think it's the same wavelength. I'm very excited and curious to know about your gig yeah. also. I think in the same space, that's where take the opportunity. Just don't go with the book of Got law it. 
of rule of three, pounce on that opportunity and say, hey, Mel, I think, yes, why don't we connect offline over a coffee or a wine? And let's discuss this more or brainstorm this more. Got it. Got it. When you say you task it, is there a way to task it in Sales Navigator or do you use your CRM to task it for yourself? It's a CRM. It's a right. CRM. Sales Navigator will not give you that. Sales Navigator will give you those, I would say, nice friendly reminders of the person putting a post or changing the role that also indirectly will help you to understand, oh, I need to go and connect with Mel. I've not been connected to Mel for a long time. Got it. That's the tips which Sales Navigator will give you, but otherwise CRM will do the needs for you. So sales navigator is really interesting. I mean, I don't know how much it's matured, but I can see that one of the things that you love on sales navigator is actually the audience and saving the That's audience. Right. So right. I'm curious to know how many audiences have you got saved in there? <laughs> I trust me, I would have at least about some 30 plus filters, uh, 30 right. plus saved searches in the current thing. Of course, I also go and delete some of them because yeah. those are not relevant. You need to remove because I keep changing domains. I keep changing industries. Yeah. So based on that, of course, I need to go and go and hunt my audiences. But at any point in time, I would have 25 plus uh, save searches. Got it. So basically, one of the biggest things is putting that saved audience into your sales nav because then you start getting data on that audience. Like, hey, this person has done this or this person's done that yes. and it's creating opportunities. So you're constantly on a different screen to the one on the news feed that a natural person is seeing news feed and you're getting all this data of all these people. But what you want is to get data of the people that you give a shit about and the people you give a shit about, you can go then actually build the audience of all the people you That's want nice. and then your feed by paying for this sales nav completely changes to only show you feed of people you actually want to do business with. And that's why people yes. use sales nav. And that seems like your favorite reason exactly. is that you can get this intel and it's not intel about everyone and anyone that LinkedIn wants to spray to you, but it's your specific audience that you've curated and told LinkedIn, I want to get information and intel. Anything that happens on this, let me know and I'll pay for that data. So if you remember, I was talking about when I started this conversation, when I talked about the three C's, the content, community, and the commitment. And I always say there's one more C, which is the outcome of these three C's, which is called capital. And now this capital could be human capital, which is your network and your relationship, or it could be your business capital, the revenue for your company. So I only care for either of these two, as you rightly said, somebody who gives me businesses or somebody who builds my network and builds, the, builds up that network strength for me. So that's the capital, which I'm in. That's the C, which I'm interested also. Cool. So I want to know a little bit more about some sales navigator tips. Like the team thing was really cool. You said there was before. What are the kind of, you know, the trends right now that you're really seeing in sales? Now? Like, you know, me, I used to love the posted the last 30 days thing for a while. Then I got into, you know, mentioned in the news. Like what are your favorite little filters that you love using in sales now? So as I mentioned to you, one was very clearly, uh, which was very important for me, was a team link filter because mm -hmm. that comes very handy to me because in an organization, which I, wherever I work, I at least should have 100 plus people working in that company going up to, of course, 700, 800 people. So team link filter really helps me to find out who are the people who are already connected to this prospect, which I'm searching for. So I don't have to go a long about way of sending. I could always say, hey, I think you know Sarath very well, who's my co-founder of the company. So I'm just, he's been talking really, really high about you. I thought it's very exciting to go and connect with you. And that's why I'm dropping my personalized invite to you so that we can stay connected to each other in the digital world. So that's how I kind of use that as a potential and I do that. So that's a very, very important feature which I do. The second top thing which I said was the saved leads which helps me to build up. It's like putting a fuel in your car and that's the starting point in a sales navigator. See today, if I don't do safe searches, how will sales navigator throw me up the leads? So I need to do the safe searches. So it's like, if I don't put a fuel in the car, how will the car take me to a different location distance? So that's something which is there. Third thing, which also I love about sales navigator is the advanced search, which I don't know many of them use it because there is an effort again. See, sales guys sometimes don't like effort. Trust yeah. me, I'm telling you. I've been a sales guy myself yeah. and I will not shy away from that. So there is something, a filter called advanced searches. Now, advanced searches, you could actually go and pinpointedly say, I only want the co-founder and the founder of the company. I really want somebody who's been in the company for at least three years. Okay, so that's the kind of nitty gritties which you can do in the advanced search. But not many people use it. People use just a standard search, but there is an option which says, Click advanced search and then you have to use a lot of other things. Or I could also say somebody who's working in this company, but 
his past company was a competitive company where i was working maybe or something then i can build up my rapport with him said hey we both work together in the same college or in the same co- same uh, company which was there it really works really well it really works when does people don't know what is that benefit of advance filter which could come up to your limelight in building up those connection third fourth sorry i said about the look alikes which is like building the lead recommendation so i build up my safe search and then i put a filter called lead recommendation so sales navigator will give me the same kind of people who i am searching for and give me automatic recommendations and the last one which i really love as a sales guy because it does not puts a lot of effort or strain on me of also at the same time going and syncing up with my crm because as a sales guy or as a sales leader i would always want my sales team to populate their crm on a regular basis at least if not daily at least weekly for sure so sales navigator really helps you in building that integrator connection with your crm whichever you are using and helps you to populate that data automatically and you don't have to again spend that time and energy to put that in the crm so i think these are the some top five tips i could probably share with you awesome awesome have you ever used zoom info to populate sales navigator yes i have used but i have always used zoom info because to find out about the company checking how they are how is the company funding stage what are they doing right now how many number of employees they are because for me that audience also has to be sizable to look at because you got certain parameters when you are looking at a prospect and every sales guy would have that for the respective organization so zoom info comes in very handy and you can actually do that integration with sales navigator where you can say you don't need to actually go to a separate page of zoom info and log in there just use the integrator and will populate the entire data for you whichever prospect which you are searching for that company and will tell you uh, all stats about that company so it really comes handy that's a really great tip again okay awesome cool so content we come to so you've got all this sales and all this outbound working and you know back i don't know two years ago i used to offer services where you could only do just outbound with are you b2b and i soon realized how much of a failure that was for so many clients that i don't actually offer outbound without content anymore because they were out there doing this outreach but they didn't have a brand and they That's couldn't right. get into a position where people wanted or enticed to talk to them so i realized that the strength was always in content and to be honest with you me myself personally have always wanted inbound because i'm not a person i guess i don't really like the chase that a natural sales person likes you know that chase i like to be chased as a female you know and i think that's a really great differentiator of people that own businesses and they don't feel comfortable doing chasing or they don't think that's their core strength I think those people really need to lean more into content than someone that's got yeah. that huntmanship, you know? So I've just always been the type of person that, you know, I want to feel like I'm being chased. So for me, I know I have to play content. I have to be more consistent. I have to put in more effort in my content because the chasing someone is just not in my blood. Like, you know, it's something that I need help with. It's something I need sales people in and that's what they are. We should talk offline for coaching. <laughs> I actually have had so many sales coaching. I just I don't want to do the sales part. I don't want to do the outbound parts, but I appreciate it. I appreciate I that it is part of it, but I'm like one of those people I I want to get people to just inbound in, but I can have an outbound strategy and I just want someone all my team to, you know, that enjoy that. Because if you don't enjoy it, right? Like Agreed. It's it's that. just not in my blood. It's so for me the exciting part is I put out a piece and I get five people coming and going, "Hey, I'm really interested." But I know you can double that by actually doing outbound. So that's, you know, if you can do two, you've got now double the opportunity. So I absolutely believe in it. But this for me it's like, you know, it's like prancing the content and then people inbound in. I mean, it's such a feel good thing. It's not a no, I'm not interested. Oh, what are you into? But outbound's gotten so much easier because of the content, yeah. you know, and it's yeah. just so complimentary. So that's why I changed the business to say no, the content yeah. you have to take that as the base and then if you want to add an outbound component, then that's fine, but I'm not going to play like before where I'm not getting results, but you're not producing any quality brand, you're not producing anything that 
why should this person even connect with you, talk with you like you're just not hitting it? So I guess for you to where you said your content really formulates part of sales and it integrates in, when you think of marketing, do you think of it as any different to sales or do you just think that's the whole process? Or do you believe that it can be done just on its own without any content? I was just having a conversation in the last week, actually, with folks from NAS Academy. We all know NAS, are doing pretty good. In fact, uh, Nasser was talking about the creator economy and it's going to be a big, big thing, which everybody knows we've been hearing this across. And if I have to be very honest, I was always an outbound guy as a sales guy because that's what I love. And what you said is right. If I wake up from the bed and if I have to do something is outbound is something which hits me. You wake me up at three o'clock in the midnight and tell me to give me a 60 second sales pitch. I will do that because that's something which is in the blood and I love doing that. Inbound or content slash was never my game. But when shit happens to you, okay, like when I moved into Singapore to a new market, to a new geo, and I had to do everything on my own as a first employee working from the trenches. And that was the shit, I would say. But that's, of course, was an opportunity. I said, now, how do I go and reach out to many people? Because with my outbound skills, I know for a fact there's a finite network which I can connect to. But if I want inbound, I want more people to notice me. And that's where I got into personal branding. And that's where after a few months, or I would say about eight to nine months, LinkedIn noticed me. And I got this modern sales awardee from them also. So I think this really works. If... And I'm saying only for sales guys, not for you, Mel. I know you don't love sales and outbound, but if a sales guys, I understand your it your 60% will be outbound. But if you can complement that with at least 30 to 40% with inbound, which is building content and making yourself build your personal brand, that would be an amazing and an awesome combination which you could probably do. Because I have seen results for myself. I have seen results for my gig, which is salt and pepper. I think it is very, very crucial for somebody to use both this together, especially being in the sales domain. And now coming to your answer of is content curation easy? I would say it's not easy, but trust me, guys, the content is everywhere. For example, we are talking, probably I met the folks from NAS guy and he was talking about the creative economy. I just pick up that word. I saw everybody's got notes. I use my iPhone notes across and I have a headline in or one of the notes saying that brainstorming or ideas for LinkedIn post and there are numerous ideas so I just walk on the road or I, when I have coffee conversations I have drink conversations I'm doing some podcast with some people I whatever conversation happens it hits me here immediately after that I write in my notes saying that okay creator economy I just put the word so it becomes much easier for me to build content around it okay or if I have gone and talked about sales like you were saying it's not everybody's game like you wake up in the bed and you want somebody to kind of get you inbound So I'm going to now write a post about inbound versus outbound Mm -hmm. as a thought process. So the content is everywhere. Okay. You need to just quickly pick those words in your day-to-day life. Just write those words and then build the content around. And today we all have the biggest master, which is Google. Okay. And of course there are Reddits of the world. There are many other places which are their mediums of the world, which can help you to give some understanding of what you can use around that content. And of course you need to curate it on your own because it has to be your views about that content. But if you can do that, you'll have a definitely a big awareness from your community and network. And that's what I've been doing this for the last many years. And one more thing which I mentioned you, if you can put your picture out there, if you can put your video out there, people start resonating with you. And I tell you a very a funny example, Mel. Uh, very recently, as late as in Singapore, while there was a networking event which I was invited to by a friend of mine. So it, this was post-COVID where everybody started kind of mingling and getting things. Uh, together and this was about six months back when I attended this very large event of about 40-50 people getting networked together and I'm not faking three people came and walked up to me and said hey by any chance you are Anil Meghani or hey Anil how are you doing and I was shocked to see that you know why because they see that I'm out there on LinkedIn and they are not my first or second network one of them was my first connection, which I didn't know because he had sent me an invite long back about 2017, 2018. And I had accepted that invite. That's all. But there were two of them who were my second and third degree connections. And they knew me because mm. probably whatever I'm posting, yeah. they are seeing me around. And yeah. they say, hey, we've been seeing you. The reason because, not because of my content only, also because I'm putting my own personal pictures. I'm building my own personal brand. So people resonate that with me. Okay. And 
that's where they say, okay, hey, I know you already, even before I've started doing conversation with you. Exactly. Do you know what's interesting? I've, I've been fascinated by how we position IUB to b and how we say what we do in the market. And uh-huh. I recently did a poll, I don't know if you saw it, but I asked about the term personal branding versus thought oh, leadership yes. content and influencer marketing because I've heard the three being exchanged by lots of different yes. thought Agreed. leaders, right? So Chris Walker does influencer marketing. He's been talking yes. about that and, you know, he's a favorite of mine. And then personal branding, I'm hearing my clients say personal branding when they're coming to me. And then thought leadership, I had someone say to me, well, that's such an old word. I'm not going to, you know, no one uses that anymore, Mel. So I was like kind of like thinking, oh, I shouldn't use that word. Maybe it's bad. But my poll showed that thought people are resonating with thought leadership more because I think they find personal branding egotistic when we say yep. personal branding. But when they, you say thought leadership, it's like almost like presented. It's the same shit, right? It's the same damn thing. So when I was looking, I only asked that because I wanted to know how to position the content and the creative content that we create for personal brands, you know, and how we position. But, you know, it's thought leadership, Anil. That's that's the resonating term that I saw. And I even looked at who voted and if that's the exact audience that, you know, that you want to resonate with. And the people that went for personal branding, what was interesting was already people that were content creators and were already far, that's you know, influencers. Right. And they're like, they understand, so they're a bit more sophisticated. But the general person that maybe you're trying to teach is actually wanting to hear thought leadership, isn't that? Because they're not that far amongst the journey. They still think personal branding is egotistical. See, see, I would say, uh, say it depends on individual to individual. And uh, I know for a fact, a lot of my audiences will be uh, thinking or might, might be getting bored seeing Anil Meghani as their picture, at least in two posts of the four posts which I do every week. But I think I'm perfectly okay. What matters to me is the outcomes. That is very important. And one of this example, which I gave you, when I went for a networking event in a conversation, three people came and walked up to me. Even before the conversation could start, they knew already about me, what I'm doing. I will also give you, I was giving an interview about a year and a half back for a change of a role. And the person, the interviewer was saying, hey, Anil, I recently saw your post and he's not connected to me. Okay. He said, I recently saw your post and which talked about this X, Y, Z. And I was really impressed the way you gave your thought processes on out there. So I'm saying there's a very thin line between thought leadership and personal branding. And I always give this example because today one still taboo, which is there in corporate world. Okay. And I know this is going on the social media, but I'm still open to going saying this. There's still a taboo in the corporate world where even I have been told, I have been trolled by my leaders or my managers saying that, Hey, Anil, I think you're wasting time on LinkedIn. Okay. Oh, you're spending too much time on LinkedIn. Okay. Now they don't know. I'm working on LinkedIn post office hours. They don't know my content is curated already. They don't know that I have an automated system of HubSpot or a Hootsuite, which helps me to post my content at the right time, even though I'm not working on the content. Hmm. So they don't know anything about this, but there are many people out there who are here to give your views about yourself that you're wasting too much time on LinkedIn. And that typically happens at sales. And I know large organizations, of course, some of them which have not worked with them, but some people outside who've been talking as friends and colleagues and peers saying that my boss, when he sees me too much visible on LinkedIn, he feels that I'm actually going to quit my job and look at something more yeah. as an opportunity. So I think this is a taboo which has been created around that the more active you are on LinkedIn, especially with your face or with your post, if you share somebody post or if you share a post about your company, that's perfectly okay. I don't think so. This really works. People have to change their mindset. Very, very critical for leaders uh, who are working at that level to change their mindset and feel. And I was doing this recently. I'm doing a workshop with one of the large telcos in Singapore for their entire marketing team. A friend of mine, she was talking to me. In fact, she was against LinkedIn and she's the head of marketing for that company. And she was against LinkedIn. I hope you're listening to this. Mm -hmm. And she said, Anil, uh, I really don't feel because I feel my team is actually looking out for I said, no, you need to change that. In fact, I will coach your team. And they have to do personal branding indirectly. Who's benefiting? It's your company. It's not them. Because a post by Anil Meghani and a post by Anil Meghani's company, okay, will definitely have a large variations in terms of engagement. Absolutely. Anil's post will go much up here, while Anil's company's post will be much here down the level. And when she agreed to this, she said, Anil, I'm fully with you. Can you come and do a two hours workshop with my team pro bono? And I'm doing that for her in the next week. That's awesome. I had the same experience when I was in corporate, when I started playing with LinkedIn. 
I had a full-time job working at a bank and I started like sort of just posting and being visible because they were trying to push that to really high up directors and they were giving them coaching on how to do that. But then I was like, I guess, more of a manager level or junior, but I thought if they're getting them to do that and you can be visible to so many people, I'll start posting. And I started posting industry insights and I started talking about the supermarket industry that I was learning about, like whatever I was learning. And what happened was one of the clients who was a really big supermarket, I think, you know, like IGA level at the time in regional, and they saw my post talking negatively about supermarkets and not, you know, like the appetite for supermarkets by the banks were going away and called someone pretty high up at the bank and said, you know, we don't like, like someone that's in your credit team is posting negatively about supermarkets and, you know, talking about, that's right, I think it was Metcash at that time was saying that, you know, we don't like that this person is talking negatively about the supermarket and lending supermarket. And, you know, at that moment, I actually got dragged into a room and got told to delete my post. And I thought at that time that they don't have the right to control what I say on my LinkedIn. It was my first ever thought. But they made me actually, and I was like kind of thinking, hang on a minute, that's my personal thing. But the way that they saw it was it's their employee and what content I put out there. But at that moment, I realized the power LinkedIn had that I could reach someone that high, like the CEO of Metcash was reaching out to someone, you know, way above my pay grade, like, you know, two, three above to tell them that I had made a post on LinkedIn, like the power that I could reach that high and resonate at that point. And I only was getting what, seven, 800 views back then. So I realized the power then. So as soon as I knew then, like, you know, I was going to quit my job anyway. And the day I quit my job, I remember, and I was flying to Pakistan at that time and I went viral for the very first time. So the day I got my freedom and left my corporate job, because they do make you feel like this. They do make you feel like you can't have a view. You can't share your thoughts, that your thoughts are their thoughts and your thoughts are not their thoughts. They should be so grateful that you have thought and that you are unique and that you're a thought leader within your space. And I was giving my point of view on supermarkets and it was a credible point of view. And instead of being applauded for having a point of view and being noticed, you were told like, no, you shouldn't have thought. So the corporate mindset has to absolutely shift. If you want to be unique, you know, you have to enable people to have thought because the thought gives you visibility, provocative. We were talking earlier, being provocative gives you the views and some people are going to hate you, but there's going to be a 1% that's going to love you and go, you know what? I love the way that she thinks and I'm going to do business with that bank because they've got intelligent bankers that understand the market. And that's the kind of bank I want to do business with just because someone else noticed it as negative. There was probably someone out there going, wow, she's fantastic that she's got that view. And, you know, that's probably a bank that we should, you know, go see what their lending appetite is. But instead of thinking like that, I think corporate's too conservative for, you know, social media sometimes. See, I'm with you completely on that. And that's one of the reasons I always tell corporates and, and I've been at the leadership levels in many organizations in the past. I say, if you are a little worried about our teams, what they are going to say out there in the social media, I know it's their personal handle. So why don't we coach them on LinkedIn? Okay, and that's what exactly we need to do as corporate leaders. Today, I know it's a personal handle, but finally the brand attached to you is the company which you're working for. And if that's the worry, let's be out there. In fact, support them and coach them what to do, what not to do. If that is done really well, then of course, he or she gets their personal branding. Plus, at the same time, the company gets the branding, which is very critical. So I think that's an approach which the corporate needs to change and probably have this mindset shift of not being a taboo about somebody who's on LinkedIn all the time, they feel. But that's not the case. In fact, indirectly, he's building a brand. And as I told you in one of my organizations, I completely build business based on LinkedIn today. Okay. And I think it was worth the effort for doing that. So we're almost near the end of our conversation. So I'd like to see, is there thoughts that you're having or something that you want to ask of me? That of is course. Com- I've huh. been on the receiving. I've been on the receiving end for a long time, Mel. Now, and I want to probably put you on a spot right now and ask you some questions and play with you probably for sixty seconds or one twenty seconds. And so, if that's okay with you, go for it. Okay, I'm nervous. So Mel, I'm, <laughs> you, you, you better be. You better be. I know I'm putting you on a spot, but I'm sorry. 
uh, you're you're a natural uh, natural. Speaker. I'm gonna I'm gonna try my best. I know you gave it to me the sort of you're gonna go and throw these at me, but I have not actually, to be honest with you, don't have the answers. I didn't even get to think about it because you just told me I might awesome. ask you these questions. So it's actually like what you wanted. It's actually like hot <laughs> off the cuff, and I'm scared for the audience and the media to chat on this. <laughs> but I think I think it's not to worry. It's basically the what I'm gonna play with you a game is called top of the mind recall. Okay. And for top of the mind recall, you actually don't need to think about this before, okay. because I really want those honest answers or candid answers to come out. Okay. So I'm going to say a few words, okay, just one word, and whatever comes to your mind associated with that word, please let me know, okay? Okay. Are you go ready? Go for it. Go. Shall I start the timer? Okay, go for it. Okay, Mel, here it's for you. The first sixty seconds, and my first word for you is LinkedIn. Algorithm keeps changing. Okay, B two B. Hmm. Very unique market uh-huh. that needs a very unique approach. Okay, I second that. A uh, growth takes time. Oh, five hundred percent with you on that. Personal branding, your favorite topic. It's the best shit that will ever happen to you if you get it right. Okay, something related to that creators economy. The creators economy, the thing yeah. that you were talking about yes. early. So I, you just enlightened me about that. So the creators economy is coming, right? And yes. So it's gonna be big. I think when I think about that, I think those that aren't, aren't part of it are going to be left behind big time. I love that. <laughs> Audience, please. repeat this answer please mel for everyone if they are not going to be with it they are going to be left behind that's right i like that i like that's it right. customers they are the core and the beating heart of your business okay content be really creative you know be emotive be provocative like stand out because there's just too much shit around okay. agree then your team magicians ah oh, i love that <laughs> are you b2b that's your company i think are you b2b is going to be one of the number one unique agencies for companies that are innovative and we're going to make you shine not just on linkedin but i think the vision is you know make you shine through content that's right that's right <laughs> then the last one Mel. Mel. Hmm. I think with me, when I think about myself, I think of someone that is so tenacious, so determined to make sure that I make a difference and make sure that I bring out the best in every person and position people to be uniquely them. So always I'm trying to be my authentic self and I want everyone else's authentic self to come out because I just think people are beautiful right that's what I think about me that's a, such a nice way to end this thing such mm-hmm. a nice way thank you so much for being a sport mel thank you anil well it was such a pleasure having you on and discussing all things i can't wait to get the sales guys to hear this i think they'll be super excited because there's lots of great tips you've given Excellent. away and yeah look forward to the next time we talk anil so thank you for sure. coming on thank you so much for inviting me mel looking forward for this episode take care cheers bye bye you are listening to innovative minds tune in every thursday and spark your mind